Oppenheimer had two great passions in life, physics and these the mountains and deserts of New Mexico. His work on the atom bomb was to bring these two passions together. For more than a decade, he'd rented a ranch high up in these, the Sangre de Cristo mountains of New Mexico, and had holidayed there every year. So when General Groves asked him to suggest a site for his bomb laboratory, it was perhaps natural he should want to locate it in his favorite part of the United States, in particular, his favorite part of New Mexico. His exploring the area around his ranch had often brought him to an isolated plateau in a deep canyon of the Rio Grande. Atop this plateau was a boys' school, the Los Alamos Ranch School, whose log cabins were scattered amid cottonwood trees 8,500 feet above sea level. To Oppenheimer, it was a place to stir the imagination, a place to think and to work uninterrupted by city and other war cares, which is what he argued to the committee who traveled out to vet the site. The date of that trip was November 16, 1942. Uh, this cold afternoon with the boys and their masters out in their shorts playing ball in the fields with a, snow, with a light snowstorm going on. It was a rather striking scene, which I well remember. Uh, General Groves immediately said, this is a suitable site. And the, uh, the legal processes for acquiring it were initiated immediately, I think the very same day or the very next day. And construction started in December. Well, things moved very fast. So that was the beginning of Los Alamos. It was a dusty, ugly, austere settlement that emerged atop that isolated plateau in New Mexico. A composite of log cabins left over from the school and shoddy, temporary, barrack-type buildings put up quickly by the army. But there was the compensation of some of the most breathtaking scenery the far west had to offer. Site Y, as Los Alamos was known to the military, was much smaller, of course, than the Manhattan Project's other secret cities. But like Oak Ridge and Hanford, its name didn't adorn any map or letterhead. Its address was simply Post Office Box 1663 Santa Fe, an address that appeared on numerous birth certificates, too, as the young wives of the scientists took advantage of the free health services and the population soared. Oppenheimer's team began arriving in the spring of 1943. It was an impressive one, eventually 5,000 strong. The best possible nuclear scientists the Allies could muster. As General Groves was later to say, not necessarily in jest, here we assemble the greatest bunch of prima donnas ever seen in one place. Uh, intellectually, it was something out of this world. I mean, you had uh, the best brains in the world to talk to, to discuss any matters. You sat down for lunch, and the chances were that half a dozen Nobel Prize winners will sit at the same table. There were fabulous possibilities for work. Anything we wanted had double X priority. There was a little annoyances from censorship and so forth, and, and uh, checking in at gates and all kinds of things, but there was, it was understandable that such a thing had to go. In fact, most of the complaints was that the security was rather lax in places. There would be big holes in the outside fence that a man could walk through standing up. And I used to enjoy going out through the gate, coming in through the fence hole, and going out through the gate again and in through the fence hole until the poor sergeant at the gate would gradually realize that this guy has come out of the place four times without going in once and he kind of arrest me, sort of. It was a place where very many friendships were made and you could occasionally get some uh, friction arising. The, uh, perhaps the trouble that came many years later over the Oppenheimer affair goes back to personal relationships uh, developed at that time. Almost all the papers which we had, documents, were classified, were top secret. Therefore, we were told they must be kept in special um, safes. Uh, sort of special cabinets that had to be locked up. But of course, science used to forget about locking up. And anybody could go around afterwards and, and see what other colleagues have been doing. So they provided us with other types of, uh, of safes, which had a combination lock. You don't leave any key at all, because you used to lose the keys. And just to have to put on a number, a combination number for three digits, to open it. Of course, what did science do to uh, try to remember this number? They had to use some number which was, which was on their mind. And as it turned out afterwards, there were about three quarters 
of all the safes had the same combination, 235, which is the uranium 235, which was, we've been working. So bang goes security again. In September 1944, the first of Hanford's three reactors went critical. But barely six hours later, it stopped and was not in operation again until the end of the year. Meantime, the second reactor had begun working, and by February 1945, the third one was operating too. In that same month, the first small sample of plutonium reached Los Alamos from Hanford. Thereafter, it came in twice a week, making the long road journey to New Mexico in a heavily guarded ambulance. It was not until March 1945 that Oak Ridge began offering any U-235. But what of the Germans? When the great Danish nuclear scientist Niels Bohr escaped to England in late 1943, he confirmed earlier intelligence reports that they too were definitely working on an atom bomb. The thought that the uh, Germans might be ahead of us in this project was uh, a terribly frightening possibility. Uh, we tried by sort of private enterprise to see what picture we could get from published information from the German scientific literature, from lecture lists of people lecturing in physics in German universities and so on. And we came to the conclusion, which turned out to be right, that uh, there was probably some work going on, and we could pinpoint the names of a few people who were likely to be connected with that, but no major effort, no uh, general movement of, of all physicists to, away from universities to special projects, as was the case here and in the United States. So there were, was a small-scale effort on, but not a big one. And this uh, later turned out to be right. But we daren't, we were afraid of relying on, uh, on, on, on that information. Alarm struck the scientific teams when it was learned that the Germans had suddenly trebled their heavy water requirements from the Norwegian plant. Something clearly was up and had to be stopped. An early commando attack on the plant failed, but a later one in 1943 partly succeeded, and thereafter Allied planes regularly pounded the place, such that when the Germans realised they had little hope of continuing production there, they ordered the entire stock of heavy water to be shipped to Germany. But Norwegian saboteurs made sure it never reached its destination. Even so, why, when they had such a head start, the German scientists failed to make a bomb, continues to puzzle. Well, I think there were several reasons. One is that some of them undoubtedly didn't want to help the Nazis uh, uh, develop a frightful weapon like that. Um, others were perhaps willing to do so, but were very scared of what might happen to them if they failed, so they preferred not to start. Then there were some who were quite keen to try, uh, but they uh, soon started uh, squabbling among each other as to who was doing what, and uh, as a result, facilities were badly divided between them and efforts were duplicated. But at the time, the Allied bomb scientists at Los Alamos didn't know of the Germans' problems. They had enough of their own. The, the big technical problem is rapid assembly. One has official material which, if put together in a supercritical mass, will undergo a chain reaction and explode, uh, while if it's separated, will not. Uh, the problem is to have a separated ma mass of material and move it rapidly together into the supercritical configuration so that it will, will go off. And the ideas of doing it by banging it together with high explosive, the simple-minded way of doing it, wasn't working. The explosive interacted with itself and it, you may squeeze in one place, but it shut out somewhere else. So there was this mechanical problem, and the, uh, uh, this, this, this simple, obvious way to do this is by uh, shooting pieces of material out of a gun so that they come together at the speed of a projectile. And that was the initial mode of assembly which was worked on. The, uh, the other mode, which turned out in the end to be much more successful, was the implosion method where the, the high explosive pushes the material in by the direct action of the high explosive without going through the interposition of a gun barrel and all this machinery. The suggestion to make a new way of doing it with high explosive was not received very 
very excitedly at first, but it gradually gained ground. In the meantime, despair reigned, I would say, for the next year. But this work was done in increasing amounts on this other way of doing it, and it gradually caused encouragement. I would describe the situation as a gradual and very slowly rising optimism. And even at the very end, we weren't sure. You could only find out if you were doing this assembly by firing it. It's not, no easy matter to look inside a very powerful explosion and see if you put things together right. It had been realized early on that a test firing would be necessary. And Oppenheimer had long selected a possible firing site here in the southern part of New Mexico, some 300 miles from Los Alamos, the desert area known appropriately enough as Jornado del Muerto, Journey of Death, a grim, arid wasteland that had got its name from the countless Spanish pioneers who had perished crossing it. Throughout 1944 and early 1945, preparations went on for Project Trinity, as Oppenheimer chose to call the first test firing of an atom bomb. It meant the building of new roads across the desert, of bunkers to house the testing equipment, above all, the erection of a hundred-foot steel tower from which the weapon would be exploded. The temperature of that explosion was expected to be the hottest the world had ever known, but the 90 degrees heat of the New Mexico desert was bad enough for the men working there. The success of the firing was in such doubt that many wondered whether it was worth wasting the precious plutonium. And so it was decided at first to contain the explosion in this massive steel chamber, inevitably nicknamed Jumbo. 25 feet long, 12 feet in diameter, its walls were 14 inches thick and it weighed well over 200 tons. In the end, when it was pointed out that if the explosion was successful, Jumbo would certainly shatter and endanger the testing equipment, the million pound steel colossus was never used. By July the 13th, 1945, it was a Friday the 13th, all was ready at the Trinity site. Enough plutonium for the test had arrived, brought without ceremony in the back of an army sedan. The general in charge of the site duly signed a receipt for it, and the final assembly of the world's first atom bomb took place inside a canvas tent at the foot of the steel tower. By late afternoon on July the 14th, the bomb, nicknamed Fat Man on account of its broad shape, was in place on top of the tower. It was on July the 14th, too, that the main components of Little Boy, as the uranium bomb had been dubbed, began their journey from Los Alamos to the Pacific island of Tinian, where the B-29 bombers had been training for the coming raid on Japan. There was still barely enough U-235 for one bomb, and because its gun exploding mechanism was simpler than the implosion idea of the plutonium bomb, a test firing was thought a luxury. All day, Sunday, July the 15th, the weather was bad at Jornada del Muerto. Nerves were tense, and many of the scientists still had doubts. I uh, thought maybe nature is cleverer than we, and that something is going to go a little more complicated than we thought, and it would fizzle out a little bit or something like that. Uh, we people who were supposed to have made contributions to the operation uh, were, tra were taken there in, four, in three buses. We left, it's about 300 miles from here, we left in the early afternoon. Along, we were chattering as scientists do, and there were of course another group already there who were on the ground doing, ex doing the instrumentation. And I remember it as a jolly, uh, carefree people going to see the end of it all. And uh, then it happened, it was in the early dawn. Of the When I saw the real explosion, and heard the loud noise 20 miles away, and I knew that the thing worked just exactly as it was designed. It was a rather eerie experience, and having been up all night, uh, people were tired, they were somewhat overcome. There wasn't a great deal of jubilation. People were pleased that there'd been a technical success. Lower the curtain over all of us. We slowly got into our buses and prepared to come back. And for three or four hours, I swear, hardly a word was spoken. It was, uh, I, I think that's the best illustration of what it did to us. 